Before we begin this evening, I invite you to just bow your heads with me as we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Heavenly Father, as we have come into your presence once again, we just ask that in a special way you would be with us. As we look at this very special art that has been passed down through generations, the art of pottery, and in the Bible, we are referred to as the clay and you are the potter. And I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to each heart the message that you have for us individually tonight. There's no way that we can explore all the many lessons that could be learned from pottery, but just as we look at a few examples, I pray that you would just draw us close to you and help us realize our worth in your sight. We claim your promise to be with us here this evening, and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You'll notice that we're not using the screen tonight, so we're doing a very different type of presentation. I kind of was thinking if we use the screen, well, then it would be uh, distracting and interfering. But I would like for you to take your Bibles, if you have them with you, and turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, and we'll start in verse uh, 2, Jeremiah chapter 18, uh, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the the potter's house, and what's going to happen at the potter's house? He says, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. So if you go down to the potter's house, the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you a message there at the potter's house. There's a specific message that I want you to learn that cannot be learned any place else. So I want you to go there, and there I will cause you to hear my words. So what is Jeremiah's response? He says in verse 3, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. The potter's, Ch Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. The potter's wheel is probably one of the oldest inventions uh, that we know of today. Uh, pottery dates back to the earliest dates that we can actually catalog are about 2,000 years before Christ and possibly even uh, before that. So it is a very ancient art, and God says that there's lessons that we can learn from this. So tonight, we don't have the opportunity to go to the potter's house literally, but we have a potter who has agreed to come here to share with us. Uh, Mark Riley has brought his potter's wheel and some clay and the utensils and tools that he will be using Really, there's not a lot of utensils and tools that are used in this art, but we're going to talk about what happens um, in making a clay vessel. John chapter 15 and verse 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Have your mic on? Yeah. Okay. Mark, the first item as you're getting ready to uh, create a new piece of pottery, what do you have to do first? Well, the first thing you have to do is select your clay, which type of clay you want to use. There's, I, I like to work in the white quite a bit, especially if I'm working with students because it's cleaner. The red clay has the iron oxides, 
like our red clay, if you go out and walk in the red fields and get clay all over you, it's very hard to clean up and you try to keep that out of students' hands as much as possible. Um, and uh, it gets in your clothes and it stains them. So I, um, I go for the, a real nice white clay uh, and there's several clay places. Uh, Tennessee is one of the leading clay places. Georgia is another and down in the Asheboro area, that's why there's so many potters down there and that area has some real nice clay deposits. So. Um, the so next, this here is a, right. a white clay. Right. All right. And I, I just cut a, a piece off. And I usually have, I have a table, so I'm not down on the ground, and I didn't, it's too big to bring in. And, and the clay's been, been processed. They dig it up, and, and they put it through a, what's called a pug mill, and it, it presses it, takes out most of the impurities, and compresses most of the air bubbles out. But even with that, a potter wants to take it and, and knead it much like you're kneading dough, dough or uh, is there any other words for kneading dough? Uh, I got, and potters call it wedging. And what you try to do is just wedge the clay down and work the air bubbles out of it. And if you notice, I kind of turned mine a little bit just to get it prepared and, and all, the, all the air bubbles out of it as much as possible and I comb the shape back up. And basically that piece is, I should wedge it a little bit longer, but for demonstration's sake, that piece is, is about ready to put on the wheel, okay? And you wanna have a bat on top of the wheel. Now remember, most of the wheels used to be just big old blocks of stone and they would just kick it, and kick it and kick it and get the centrifugal force of the, to, to spin that uh, piece of stone around. And uh, now we're highfalutin and we have these electric wheels. And when I was sharing with Mark yesterday, not only is pottery special to me because of, it, it's been a really neat thing, we, but I met my wife and I wanted to take a potter's class and I heard about some really excellent potters in this college in California. And I walked in and I sat down and when I sat down, I looked directly across the room for me and there she was on a kick wheel kicking that wheel, and, and uh, I just walked over and said, you are beautiful. <laughs> and that was, a, <laughs> that was a long time ago, and we, we did some potting for a while, and then we decided to, uh, we, did other, we did our jobs, and so we've been away from pottery for probably 34 years. And about three months ago, I just, decided, you know, the kid's been asking about it at school, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show them how to do some pottery. And so I started making pots again. And it's been a lot of fun for her and I, again, a stress reliever. So you just put the clay on the, on the wheel, and you want to get it pretty firm down on the, on the potter's wheel so it doesn't fly off because centrifugal force is gonna to try, to, try to do that to you. And it's like when I watch Mark play the piano, he makes it look so easy, doesn't he? And that would probably be another great service as if, if he does the pottery and I play the piano <laughs> to show that it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> and you, you want to center the clay so Mark and I were talking about centering and, and our relationship also with to, not only to one another but to Jesus. Um, when our life is centered and built around Jesus, it sure makes a difference than when we walk in our own ways and our own decisions. Oops. Another thing I want you to notice is what he's doing is he's bringing up the clay into a cone shape and then pushing it back down. Why is that, Mark? Um, it's, it's forcing the clay to, to stretch itself and to re, redefine its shape. Clay has a memory, and when you push it back down, you're trying to get it squared, I mean, centered, so everything is, is affirmed. And if you don't do that, the clay is just going to go all over the place. You're going to lose complete control of it. In our spiritual walk with the Lord, have you ever felt like that you were 
coming up to a high point that you were on a mountaintop experience and perhaps after that you felt like you were going back down into the valley, I'd like to, for us to remember that in the process of God creating in us what he wants us to be, it's really just all part of the process. Yes, we may be brought up and we may be brought back down, but it's part of God's method of bringing out in us the best that he wants for us. Going back a little bit to the choosing of the clay, Mark, when you picked out this clay, when you brought this lump of clay in, what did you see in that clay? <laughs> or perhaps you don't want to tell us what you saw, but did you see something more than oh, yeah, perhaps I, just, I saw? I just look at each cube. Each cube is 25 pounds, and, and I determine how many pieces of pottery I will create out of that one piece of clay. Whether I want to do two big pieces, one big piece, which would be huge, or small pieces like the teapot or, or like Holly's little planter. And I try to envision how much, how many pieces I can make out of each one. So I can already see the end from the beginning when, when I look at that lump of clay. He is the potter looking at this simple lump of clay. Sees the end from the beginning. God rejoices over what we can become. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. No matter what point in our spiritual development we are, God looks at us and sees what we can become, and he rejoices over us. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 tells us that God looks on the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks on the, on the heart. And as Mark was sharing with us earlier about how he chooses the clay, the different types of clay that are available, you're looking at what the composition of the clay is and how it will perform under pressure and, and heat and how it will... Um, submit really to your touch and become what you want it to be. Right, and this, this type of clay right here does not have what's called grog in it, which is kind of a sand base. The more sand or more grog you put into clay, the easier it takes to expansion and contraction. And, and uh, this and, and porcelain, it, it has very little grog in it, very little sand. It's very, very smooth to the touch probably a little bit easier to throw, but a lot more control methods when you're firing in a kiln because it can't take that sudden expansion uh, and contraction. So when that kiln heats up, you've got to heat it up very, very slowly. You've got to be very temperamental with this kind of clay in, in the firing process. And, and there's two different types of fire, well, there's you know, two different types of firing processes that I use. One is electric and the other one is gas. Although sometimes uh, we do use we can use wood, and, and that is called a, a raku firing that we do that comes from Japan, and it has a lot of grog because you take that, put in a real quick wood fire, and the clay expands, it heats up, and then you take that clay out, and it's glowing red. It's really beautiful at nighttime, and you put it in a bunch of sawdust, and then you put the sawdust on top of the clay, which causes a reduction and causes it to have all kinds of different beautiful colors. So there's clay is not just sitting up here and throwing, but it's knowing all the other processes, how to create your glazes, how to create your fires. And, and a person can spend a lifetime just trying to learn all that stuff. And, and that's kind of neat because isn't that how our walk is with Christ? We're constantly trying to learn mm -hmm. about our walk with Jesus. And he's trying to teach us. And, and I know I'm slower than most, so he's taken a long time for, and a lot of patience with me.